It is so good to be with you, True North. We are kicking off. Uh, I'm really excited about this. Today, we are starting a new focus for this month. It's called 2030. And the whole idea is that this month, uh, we're going to think about the future. We're going to think out into the future. You know, 2020 is kind of like this landmark kind of year, uh, decade, just the whole roundness of it, 2020. And it, it gives you that sense of, of the fresh kind of start. And so we always wanted this year to stop and to look out into the future. You know, one of the things about the future, uh, you know, whenever I think about the future, I kind of, I feel like I want to explain to you the space-time continuum to start with. I feel like it's an important part of understanding the future. So basically, uh, this is the space-time continuum. Now, if we want to fix the future, we have to go back in time to some point. Just kidding. That's not, I'm, we, you know, we won't go all the way there, but I know some of you are with me and the good Dr. Emmett Brown. But... Uh, we're going to think about the future like this. This is why we're thinking about the future. Here is, this is my, this can be my little diagram. I will use a little diagram though. Uh, I don't often use diagrams, but I can, this one, I think, whoops, I, I already, uh, my handwriting could be a little tricky. Don't worry. I got it. Here we go. 20, 20. Now on this complex diagram, 2020 represents where we are right now. Okay. That's, that's today. Over here is 20, 30. Okay, so this is like a timeline. Now, here's the thing, and the reason that we are thinking about the future is because, okay, here is the future. For now, at, you know what? Right now, we are already closer to this moment than when I started talking to you today. That's how this timeline works. We are going to keep moving towards the future. We can't, that's how God's created things. We're just always moving that direction. Now, here's the thing, though. What we arrive at in 2030 and what 2030 looks like is going to be determined between here and there. The whole idea of this series is that we are called to help create the future, to partner with God in shaping what life on the world he created looks like. Now, here's what I know is some of us, when we think about the future, there's different ways we could think about it. Uh, for some of us, you know, we can look at the future and think, oh man, the world is going to be, uh, the future almost makes us, I'll give it a little sad face emoji. I'm a good artist. I know. I always have pride myself on this. Uh, some people look at the future and like, man, things are just getting bad. It's getting terrible. Things are not going well. Oh, the future will never be as good as the past. That's one approach sometimes people have when they think about the future. Uh, another approach is just kind of, you know what? Life just kind of trucks along. Life's always going to be moving. And 2030, you know what? Don't think too much about it. You work, you pay your taxes, whatever. Uh, so we're going to give that a just kind of flat, you know, just kind of, I don't know, it's the future. It'll happen. We'll see what happens. But the, the, the view of the future that I want us to consider uh, over this next four weeks as we think together is a view of the future that is just, that there is a possible 2030 that is just a bright and glorious future. That God actually has a future in mind that is, that is wonderful and possible. I, I hear so many people lately talk about 2020, like, oh man, 2020, like how much worse could it get or more difficult? I don't believe that's how God wants us to look at this moment or how we should approach the future. But I believe he wants us to look and say, God, how can we be a part of creating the future that you imagine? And here's, so here's what I believe. I believe there is, a, there is a possible future out there like that. But whether or not 2030, how it looks is going to depend entirely on how we live right here. This is where life is happening right now. How do we live here? This is where we can make changes that will determine what it looks like in the future, right? You know, the, one of the, I think, I, I guess kind of pictures of this that I hope we can go forward with is, is to realize this. We can't, there are lots of things, of course, in this line that, that we cannot determine, we cannot choose. There will be certain things that are for, absolutely beyond our control. I'm not trying to say we have the capability of creating just a, a perfect tomorrow. But what I am saying is that I believe God calls us to partner with him to create a better future. And that no matter what, some of the things that happen that are out of control, there are always those things that God has asked us 
to be a part of taking responsibility for on his good creation. And when we partner together with God, we can actually have a part. He invites us to it. He calls us to it, to creating a better future. You know, today, what we're going to do to kick this off, uh, to get started, is we're going to look at a story in the scriptures. And it's a story of, uh, if you're familiar with the scriptures, you'll, you know his story. It's a story of, we, only, we don't know his name. We just know him as the rich young ruler. His story appears in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and all three of those gospels. It's an important story because it's the story of, of a young man who encountered Jesus, and he was offered the opportunity of a glorious future. And yet, in his conversation with Jesus, his story is known to us because of its sad ending. He misses the the beautiful future that Jesus is going to offer him. And so as we kind of kick off this idea of looking forward to the future today, we're going to look at his story, and we're going to look at why did he miss it? How did he miss it? Because we don't want to arrive in 2030 and think, Jesus, we missed the future that you had put right in front of us. And so we're going to check out his story today. I hope it'll be helpful to you. I'm going to read it to you. His story, we're going to read uh, Matthew 19, as I said. You'll find it Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Different details each of them uh, give us. But here's what happens in his life. It says, just then, a man came up to Jesus and he asked, teacher, uh, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Now, a couple of the other uh, versions of this He says to Jesus, good teacher. He actually calls Jesus a good teacher. And Jesus, in verse 17, he says this. Why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones? He inquired. Jesus replied, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus takes him to the second five of the Ten Commandments, and then he throws in the summary statement from Leviticus to love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? What am I missing here? Because he he knows. He's like, I I haven't found it. I'm I'm not living in that space yet. And Jesus answered, if if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions. And give to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven, and then come, follow me. Now, when the young man heard this, he went away sad, because he had great wealth. And so then, Jesus said to his disciples, you know what, I tell you, it is hard, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of God. And when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished because they thought, you know, being rich, you would have all the advantages. And they asked, who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and he said, look, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Now, the reason I love this story is because you this, this young man, now he's a, he's a rich, he's young, he's rich. We're told elsewhere he's a ruler, he's got like a, a heavy leadership. But he's the kind of person, like he's got everything going for him. <clears throat> all, all kind of green lights in his life. He's young, he's rich, he's powerful. But he knows that there's something kind of missing. And, and can you imagine this, having the opportunity to talk to Jesus, you know, to like, man, I'm going to find out about what I, I need to, how do I find that thing? And we get let in on the conversation. Because what happens for him, we're, we're going to imagine this, you know, he's living in, let's just say he was living in uh, 30, not 2030, but we'll just say he was living in 30 AD. And he meets Jesus at this point. And eventually, we'll just assume he lived at least 10 more years. He was going to make it to 40 AD. Now, at this point, he has an opportunity to say, what will this look like? 
And he comes up to Jesus because he feels like Jesus will have some insight into how he, he comes to Jesus asking about this question. How do I find eternal life? And the words they're talking about here is this word zoe. Uh, we talk about this often. It's this idea. It's not just about am I alive? Do I have bios life? Like am I physically breathing? This is a conversation about how do I find life? abundant life, the abundant life Jesus came to bring. And what he chooses here is going to have an impact on what happens next in his life. And will he, Jesus is going to give him some, a, a pathway, but will he embrace it or not? And the, the tragic story about his story, we don't have a story finished, but of this scene of this young man's life is that he walks away sad. And he instead chooses default reality. He instead chooses, I'm just going to stay put. I'm just going to do what I've always done. I'm just going to rely on what I've always relied on. Now, here's what uh, this, this story, there's, there's a few things. Now, if you're watching this, and I assume if you can see and hear me, you're watching this. Um, uh, as I understand, that's how it works. I could do another diagram, but... If you're watching this, then by default, uh, you are, in the historical and global perspective, a person of means. The rich young ruler could not imagine the technology that you and I have access to today. So while one part of us may want to say, well, he was a rich young ruler, I'm not really rich, we have to understand in global historical perspective, uh, we are all in this conversation probably want to say, you know what, Jesus, uh, what do we need to see here as well? And have to understand that grabbing hold of the life Jesus has for us and the possible future he has for us will be, as he says here, hard. And why was it so hard for this young man? Well, let's look and let's just, let's just kind of revisit this conversation. Well, you know, the first thing that was kind of a barrier, Jesus says, it's so hard, it's so hard for a rich person to enter. And one of the reasons it was hard, if you look at the conversation and you go back and you read this in, in, in Matthew and Mark and Luke, and when the rich young man comes to Jesus, he, he starts with this question of how can I, how can I, he says, good teacher, what can I do to gain eternal life? And, and Jesus, first thing he talks to him about is this. He says, why do you call me good? There's only one who's good. It's God. And Sometimes, some people have read that and they thought, oh, is this Jesus kind of saying, well, I'm not God, you know, but yet, wait, everywhere else, Jesus says, I am God. Jesus isn't saying he's not God, but guess what he's doing right here? Is he is going to try to help this young man who, in, in Mark's account, it tells us Jesus loved him. Jesus looking at him with love. He, want, he is for this young man. He wants the bright, the, the bright, glorious future for him. And he says to him, why do you call me good? And the reason he says, why do you call me good? Or there's only one who's good and that's God is he wants this rich young man to do something. And that is to reflect a little bit more deeply on his words. And not only that, but on his heart. In fact, what we'll see as we go into this story is that in lots of ways, this is a conversation where Jesus is just trying to help him get in touch with some of the gaps in his life. He was probably, some commentators would say he was a bit flippant coming up to Jesus. Good teacher. You know, that that wasn't always a term that most would have applied to a rabbi. And it's almost like Jesus wants him to slow down and start to get in touch with his words, what he's saying, because that's going to reveal what he's thinking. And that's going to reveal what's going on in his heart. But he asks him, what do I do? What do I have to do to gain, to get, to have eternal life? Now, what's really interesting is that's the question he asks. How do I get it? How do I have it? I want eternal life. I want this abundant life. I want, you know, the, the beautiful future that you have for me, God. And it's like he's saying to you, so how, how do I get that? How do I have that? Do you know one of the reasons, one of the challenges when you are a, a, a person who has much in this life, one of the challenges is that to have the kind of life that Jesus is talking about here, it can become too easy to think it as one more possession to add to your riches. He asks this question, like, what do I have to do to get it? And Jesus, though, answers it by saying, here's how you enter it. He comes, it's almost like this. You know, when I was in uh, high school, you would go to often a, a dance. You know, there'd be a dance and you would go. And if you wanted to get into the dance, you had to have a ticket. If things were going really well, you wanted to really have two tickets. And, um, but if you wanted to get into the dance, you had to have a ticket. 
And so you could go and you could get a ticket, but imagine I went and I wanted to go to the dance and it was going to be fun and you're going to be dancing, all these things. But I got that ticket and I was like, awesome. I got my ticket to the dance. This is fantastic. And I carried it around. It's the lead up to the dance. I got it in my pocket. I'm just so stoked, man. I've got a ticket to the dance. Maybe I've even got two tickets, you know, Uh, but I've got a ticket to the dance. And then the weekend of the dance maybe comes and goes. But I'm like, I don't want to give up that ticket. I'm just going to keep it in my pocket. I, and, I, and you just kind of keep, and I kept walking around, imagine, you know, and then I go and it's like, hey, you didn't come. It's like, it doesn't matter. I got my ticket. I got my ticket. Now, here's the thing. There is a world of difference between having that ticket and being in there and dancing, isn't there? Like they are not, they're not remotely close to being the same thing. That's important. You got to have the ticket. That thing matters. Uh, but Here's the thing, this young man saw eternal life like, how do I get it? I want to have it. I want to make sure I have it. And Jesus is going to say to him, you don't just kind of have this as one more thing in your life. It is a way of life you enter. It is a dance you begin to take part in. That's how, that's what eternal life looks like. In fact, Jesus takes him now immediately to uh, the Ten Commandments. And so Jesus, he says, you know, here's what you got to do. You got to obey the commands. And the rich young man's like, well, which ones? What do I got to obey? Now notice what Jesus does is he takes him to the second five of the 10 commandments. Now check this out. I'll I'll use my board again for a moment. Let's see. Is it going to be too full? We'll try this. Here are, here's, here's a line. So that's one idea. Below the line's another idea. Here are the first, we're going to call them the first five commandments. And then here, perfectly aligned are the second five. The Ten Commandments are broken, if you've never noticed this, into two sets, basically. The first five, uh, you'll have no other gods before me. Don't make any idols. Don't bow down before them. The first five of the Ten Commandments all deal with how does a person love God more than anything? Jesus effectively elsewhere summarizes these first five as love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. So that's the first five of the Ten Commandments. The second five deal with what Jesus, which is where Jesus takes the rich young man, all deal with relationships. And Jesus summarizes them at the very end of it. The verse from Leviticus, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, what is Jesus doing here? We know, and and if you're a person who normally reads the Bible or you're, you're, you're a Christian, been in church for a long time, you'll probably go, wait a second, wait a second. The way to get to eternal life is obeying commandments. Wait, that doesn't seem quite right. Wait a second, wait a second. And the ones he's talking about is just a bunch of, of, it's like how you just do these certain things. Is that right? Like, if uh, that's not how I thought it was supposed to work. Aren't you supposed to, isn't it grace? Isn't it? What Jesus is trying to do here is he's showing this young man, yes, of course, it is all about uh, loving God with all your heart and soul and mind. But the reason Jesus takes him to the second five commandments is because whether or not we love God with our heart, soul, and mind, and strength will always be evidenced in whether or not we love our neighbor as ourself. You see, a lot of commentators, in some ways, one of the great phrases I've seen for this is these first five represent the essence of faith. They represent the essence of how we are to relate to God. It always starts, the essence is, do you love God more than anything? Because if you love anything else more than you love God, You will not enter into life. You will not start living in the kind of dance moves that God wants for your life. Put anything else as what you love most, everything falls apart. You will not enter eternal life. And by that, I just mean you will not not find that Zoe experience of life that Jesus wants for us. But the second five are what is the evidence of whether or not you love God with all your heart and your soul and your mind. Jesus takes him there because he's like, for the young man, I mean, he could have said to him, do you love, you know, have you followed the first five? And it would have been easy for him to say, yeah, yeah, no, I don't, I don't make idols. I don't bow down before anything else. I got all that under control. Jesus takes him to the second five because he wants him to understand that what really shows whether or not you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength is do you love your neighbor as yourself? Now check it out. This is where it gets really hairy for him. So the young man, what's he say? Jesus is like, yeah, do these. And the young man's like, tick, <laughs> tick, 
I've done it. Done it since I was a kid. I've got it. Locked and loaded, Jesus. But I'm still missing something. What else do I have to do? And then Jesus, he, he, he looks at him, he loves him, and he says to him those words, well, go sell everything you have, give to the poor, and then come on, come follow me. Now, a lot of people don't like to even engage the story because they're like, oh, no, what if Jesus says it to me? <laughs> I don't, oh, I don't even want to talk to you about this one, Jesus. Um, you know, what we have to understand here is here's Jesus. This is what Jesus is like. He is like this. Uh, he, is, he is the all-time uh, perfect surgeon of the human soul. And he knows, and by that, I mean, he knows exactly uh, how to get to the, the absolute parts of us that are most in need of healing. And when Jesus, so when Jesus says to him, you got to sell everything you have, give it to the poor, because Jesus wants him to come face to face with this reality. This young man thinks, believes, is confident that he has loved his neighbor as himself. And Jesus is going to show him just how far short of that reality he falls. That in fact, what occupies the greatest place of affection in his heart is his riches. And those very riches are keeping him from entering a life of loving God with all his heart and soul and mind and loving his neighbor as himself. Now, here is what, and, and, and then, of course, the rich young ruler hears this and he goes away sad because he's like, I, I was ready to do a lot of things, but I was not ready to do that. And Jesus says, it's hard, it's so hard. To enter. Now, here's, here's what I, I hope we can kind of wrap our minds around today. One of the things I love about this story is it reminds us that where life is to be found and where a big, bright, glorious, wonderful future is to be found is in the simple, but not easy, but in the simple and profound reality of loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then loving your neighbor as yourself. That's the dance. That's the moves. That's, the, that's how you enter it. That's how eternal life doesn't become a ticket that I think I'm going to cash in one day and go in. That's how you enter the kingdom, as Jesus said, and start to live in this way right here and right now in a way that's going to eventually go on into a perfected, glorious, eternal life. And this story reminds us that the core of how you enter that is just that. Love God more than anything, and love your neighbor as yourself. Do you know when people look at 2030 in the future, like there are problems. How many people in our world's got problems? Huge ones. But can I tell you something? If you boil it all down, I mean, the problem is so big, sometimes they do feel overwhelming. It's why people end up thinking about the future like that. But yet... There is not a problem on planet Earth that would not be resolved by human beings learning to love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength and love their neighbor as themselves. There is not a problem on Earth because that's the dance. That's how it was meant to work. That's who God is. God is love. That's who he created us to be, people who love him and love others. And the future that we long for and God dreams for will be found as we get back to that simple reality that that is what it's all about. Being a people who love God and love others. But the challenge, why is it so hard? Why was it so hard for this rich young man? Because sometimes we just want it to likewise be the ticket. Look, I'm good. I'm sorted. I'll be all right. And some day, you know, if I should die in this next 10 years, I know that's great and that's good. But the reason we don't always enter into it now is because we can just think about it like just a ticket in our pocket instead of going, how do I enter into this way of life? Of loving God and loving other people. That's one of the first things that makes it. You know what else makes it so challenging? It's because we don't really enjoy, just as the rich young ruler didn't enjoy it, we don't really enjoy facing current reality. You see, the rich young ruler came at this and went, yes, I got it. 
I do those things. I've been doing them since I was a kid. But you know what? If he had followed anything Jesus, I mean, he comes up to Jesus, good teacher. I want to know what you got to say. If he had followed anything Jesus had been teaching publicly at this point, he would have known that Jesus had very clearly been trying to teach and explain people to understand these commands as you, just because you think you fulfilled the letter of the law does not mean that you, Jesus said, look, you, you think you did not murder? Well, I'm telling you, if you even call somebody a fool, you broke it. Jesus has been trying to help them understand the commands are the way, but no one can measure up to them. The honest answer for the rich young ruler and the honest answer for me and the honest answer for you, unless you are Jesus perfect, the honest answer for all of us, when Jesus says, obey these commands, is not, yes, I did it. It's, you're right, Jesus, I fall short of that. And, and Jesus has this way of poking at us sometimes just to help us see, not because he's mean to us, but because, like the rich young ruler, he loves us. And so for us to actually enter, Jesus says, look, it's hard, but it's not impossible. With God, everything is possible. Everything is possible with him. It is possible for you and I to start to enter into this kind of dance of love in this world. But it only happens when we do what two things that the rich young ruler was unwilling to do, but we can learn from. And this is a chapter in his life. We don't know the end of his story. But in this chapter, there were two things he was unwilling to do. One was to honestly and deeply examine his heart. You see, right from the beginning when he says, you know, good teacher, and Jesus is like, hey, hey, hold on, who's good? He's, Jesus is trying to get him to go, slow down. You need to reflect on your heart. And so when he tells him, look, you've, you've got to love, love your neighbor yourself. And the rich young ruler is like, no, 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 I did that. Then Jesus is like, look, I'm going to show you just how far that you've fallen short. If that's so true, if you're willing to love your neighbor as yourself, you love God more than anything, well, then go ahead, sell everything. Give to the poor. Come follow me. And in doing that, he exposes the, what the rich young ruler didn't want to do, which was honestly examine his own heart. Do you know this... this um, this weekend, I mean, this last week's been pretty remarkable around the world. And just this last weekend in cities around our nation, the Black Lives Matter movement, there have been protests and rallies and voices rising up together saying this is an unjust world. And this has been happening around the world. And it's painful and difficult. But it is also perhaps a moment of hope. Can I tell you something? We as followers of Christ, we should be at the absolute forefront of being willing to say, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Not because we're trying to beat ourselves up, but because what we see in Jesus' interaction with the rich young rulers, are we all willing and able to understand we all fall short? And it's only when we are honest about our own shortcomings that we can find the pathway to life. You know, Jesus never asked anyone else to sell everything that they had and give it all away. In fact, one time, another rich guy, Zacchaeus, said, I'll give away half of my stuff. And Jesus is like, boom, life, salvation has come to you today. Rich young ruler would have been like, I would have taken that deal. Why is Jesus doing it? He just wants all, what Jesus is after. Where we get to in the future is when we're willing to face what's in our own heart. And the reason I say Christians should be at the forefront because we are the people who have a story that allows us to both affirm that all people were created in the image of God. And so we actually have a framework that demands that of us. And we have a framework that reminds us that and all life is meant to be about is loving God and loving my neighbor. And we have a framework that reminds us, oh yeah, and I don't do that perfectly. And not only do we have that, we have a framework that says, and there's grace on top of that, that we don't need to feel crippled or afraid. The rich young ruler didn't need to feel like he had to pretend to have done it all right. He could, if he understood the grace that was in Jesus, he could have just said, you're right. I thought I'd done those well, but I can see there's further to go. Jesus, would you teach me? And that, that right there, would have opened up an entirely different future.
The only thing that closes off that future opportunity is when we want to pretend like we've got it all together when we don't. And here's the second thing that the rich young ruler is unwilling to do on that day that can so often keep us from that future that Jesus wants for us. And that's that once Jesus had pinpointed it, once Jesus had targeted what was going on in his heart, he was unwilling to do that which was uncomfortable for him. His whole life, his riches had been his security blanket. His whole life, his riches had been that which, what all Jesus has done in this whole conversation is said to him, basically, and out of absolute love for the young man, you don't love God with all your heart and soul and mind. And I'm going to show you that something else is occupying first place in your life. And Jesus got him there, but the rich young ruler walked away sad because he knew there was like there was a possibility here, but I'm unwilling to do what is too uncomfortable to sell everything I have, to let go of it. And here's and why, because he thought, what's going to happen if I let go of everything I've got? Jesus was offering him a future out here, but he couldn't see it. How was he supposed to know? If I follow you, Jesus, who knows where you're going to take me? And what, what will I have? What will I? And so he, he was caught in this place where the, the comfort of being able to hold on to what he'd always known and what had always brought him security, the thought of losing the comfort and what he had always put first for an unknown future, it was just too much for him. And he walks away sad. And on that day, he missed this great glory. Because when Jesus said, come follow me, while it might not have felt like it to the rich young ruler in that moment, what we know is that he might have had a life with less stuff, but he would have had Zoe life. He would have had abundant life. The future, if he'd have chosen that path, would have been extraordinary. Would have been extraordinary. Hands down, bar none, end of story. This is the challenge that we always face. If we're going to create the future, this is, this is the challenge. If we're going to partner with God in the future that he wants to create in this world, it requires it requires a, a willingness to be honest with God, honest with ourselves, to let him lead us and teach us. And I guarantee it will end up always requiring this one thing. You cannot create a new future until you are willing to let go of what has brought you comfort and security in the past. There are, God is always in the business of saying, if you're going to, Come to the future. I have, there are things you will need to leave behind. In fact, here's the, in the final picture I'll give you. This is all a picture of what Jesus is always talking about. Uh, here, this is how it plays out. Elsewhere, his message was always repent for the kingdom of God is near. The word repent is this Greek word, metanoia. The whole idea is experience a transformation of your mind, of your thoughts, a transformation of your life. But you cannot transform until you are willing to let go of what you once were. The future Jesus has for all of us. It's bright and beautiful. It's a glorious future. But it always requires a willingness to let go of what has often occupied first place in our life, a willingness to let go of what would keep us from the future he has for us. Now, here's what I want to encourage you to to do and to reflect on today or this week, is to begin to, in conversation with Jesus, because here's the thing. I, I just think it's always better not to shut off a conversation with Jesus by saying, I got this one. <laughs> like the rich young, I got it. Always done it. End of story. Let's move on. Next thing. The best thing that all of us can do is just to continue an ongoing conversation with Jesus going, what's the future you imagine? And if I'm going to love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and I'm going to love my neighbor as myself, what then would you ask of me? How can I do that better? The whole point is not, do we get it perfect? No, the whole point is, are we listening? Are we growing? Are we developing? Are we honest about where we are so that we can receive grace into our lives and step into and enter into 
this dance of Zoe life, eternal life that Jesus invites us to. I'd love to invite you to take a moment just right where you are and just to maybe stop and take a deep breath. I've been speaking at you for quite a while. We've been on this conversation, but just stop. Maybe take a deep breath. Just close your eyes. And I want to encourage you to adopt a posture of openness towards God. To maybe in your own words and in the ways you need to this morning, to just say to him, you know what, God, I, I recognize I don't, I don't always love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I don't always love my neighbor as myself. But I confess that. I ask for your grace and your mercy in my life. And I pray that you would lead me in the, in the path that leads to life. Lead me in the way everlasting. I want to encourage you to pray that. And then I'm going to pray a prayer of blessing over you in just a moment. You know, just for a moment, why don't you close your eyes right where you are, wherever you are watching this. It's such a beautiful moment. Wherever you are, we are all together. We're in his presence. I'm going to pray a prayer for you. It comes in two parts. And the first is a prayer of confession. And it's just a short one. It's, I, I came across this in a book I love this week. It comes from the Book of Common Prayer. And it's just a great, beautiful way to acknowledge our shortcomings before God. I'm going to pray that. And then I'm going to pray from a second prayer, also from the Book of Common Prayer, a prayer of blessing over us today and into your week. If you'd like to be part of this, just open your hands right where you are. Encourage you, even in your own mind, as you kind of follow along, you just kind of acknowledge these things before God. Most holy and merciful Father, we confess to you and to one another and to the whole community of saints in heaven and on earth that we have sinned by our own fault in thought, word, and deed. By what we've done, by what we've left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, mind, and strength. We've not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We've not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. Have mercy on us, Lord. We've been deaf to your call to serve as Christ served us. We've not been true to the mind of Christ. We've grieved your Holy Spirit. Have mercy on us, Lord. And as we bring our confessions to him, we seek him for his blessings. We're grateful for his forgiveness, that it's not the end of the story. Oh God, you have taught us to keep all your commandments by loving you and our neighbors. Grant us the grace of your Holy Spirit that we may be devoted to you with our whole heart and united to others with pure affection through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You know, I love that reality we come before him we're honest with him there is forgiveness there is mercy and there is empowerment to live a fresh life to step into zoe life a life of loving god and loving others you know it's been fantastic to be with you today our hope is that over this next four weeks you know god could do something something wonderful in us as a people, a tribe of people here at True North. Show us where he wants to take us over the next 10 years that we might together be part of creating the future, the future God desires, the future God dreams. That 2030 could look a whole lot different than 2020 because of what God does in us today, the next four weeks and over this next decade together. Amen, and have a great week, everybody.